I read the good words of Mr. Munger, Vice President of Berkshire Hathaway. Mr. Munger explained his worldly wisdom through the example of the Coca-Cola company. How to turn $2 million into $2,000 billion by Charlie Munger. In this talk, Charlie explains how he makes decisions and solves problems by taking us step by step through a diverse set of mental models. He presents a case study that asks a rhetorical query how the listener would go about producing a $2 trillion business from scratch using an example Coca Cola. Naturally, he has his own solution apt to strike you as both brilliant and perceptive. Editor's warning as suggested by Charlie. Most people don't understand this talk. Charlie, Charlie says it was an extreme communication failure when made, and people have seen found it difficult to understand, even when read slowly twice. To Charlie, these outcomes have profound educational implications. Practical thought about practical thought. An informal talk, 1996. The title of my talk is Practical Thought about Practical Thought, with a question mark at the end. In a long career, I have assimilated various ultra-simple general notions that I found helpful in solving problems. Five of these helpful notions I will now describe. After that, I will present to you a problem of extreme, extreme scale. Indeed, the problem will, will involve turning startup capital of $2 million into $2 trillion, a sum large enough to represent a practical achievement. Then I will try to solve the problem, assisted by my helpful general notions. The first helpful notion is that it is usually best to simplify problems by deciding big no-brainer no question first. The second helpful notion mimics Galileo's conclusion that scientific reality is often revealed only by mass, as if mass was the language of God. Galileo's attitude was also was well in messy practical life. Without numerical fluency in the part of the life most of us inhabit. You are like a one leg man in an ass kicking contest. The third helpful notion is that it is not enough to think to think problems through forward, you must also think in reverse, much like the rustic who wanted to know where he was going to die so he never goes there. Indeed, many problems can be solved forward. And that is why the great Algerian Carl Jacobi so often said, invert, always invert. And why the Pythagoreans sought in reverse to prove that the square root of 2 was an irrational number. It is not usually the conscious malfeasance of your narrow professional advisor that you do, you do that does you in. Instead, your troubles come from his subconscious level. The fourth helpful notion is that the best of most practical wisdom is elementary academic wisdom. But there is one extremely important qualification. You must think in a multidisciplinary manner. You must routinely use all the easy learned concepts from the Frenchman course in every basic subject where elementary ideas will serve. Your problem solving must not be limited, as academia and many business bureaucracies are limited, by extreme balkanization into disciplines and sub-disciplines, with strong taboos against any venture outside assigned territory. Instead, you must do your multidisciplinary thinking in accord with Ben Franklin's prescription in Poor Richard. If you want it done, go. If not, send. If, in your thinking, you rely entirely on others, often through purchase of professional, often through purchase of professional advice, whenever outside the small territory of your own, you will suffer much calamity. And it is not just difficulties in complex coordination that will do you in. You will also suffer from the re reality evoked by the Shavian character who said, in the last analysis, every profession is a conspiracy against the laity. Indeed, the Chavian character for once understated the, the horror of something Shaw didn't like. It is not usually the conscious malfeasance of your narrow professional advisor that does you in. Instead, your troubles come from his subconscious peers. His cognition will often be impaired for your purposes by financial incentives different from yours. And will also suffer from the psychological defect caused by the proverb, to a man with a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. 
The fifth helpful notion is that really big effects, Lola Palooza effects, will often come only from large combination of factors. For instance, tuberculosis were, was termed, at least for a long time, only by routine, combined use in each case of three different drugs. And other Lola Palooza effects, like the flight of an airplane, follow a similar pattern. It is now time to present my practical problem, and here is the problem. It is 1884 in Atlanta. You are brought along with 20 other li others like you before a rich and eccentric Atlanta citizen named Gloats. Both you and Gloats share two characteristics. First, you routinely use in problem solving the five helpful notions. And second, you know all the elementary ideas in all the basic college courses as taught in 1996. However, all discovers all discoverer and all example demonstrating these elementary ideas come from days before 1884. Neither you nor Gloss knows anything about anything that has happened after 1884. Gloss offers to invest $2,1884, yet take only half the equity. The other half of the new corporation equity will go to the man who most possibly demonstrates that his business plan will cause Gloss Foundation to be worth a trillion dollars 150 years later, in the money of that later time, 2034, despite paying out a large part of its earning each year as a dividend. This will make the whole new corporation worth two trillion even after paying out many billions of dollars in dividends. You have 50 minutes to make your pitch, what do you say to Gloats? Here is my solution, my pitch to Gloats, using only the helpful notions that and what every bright college sophomore should know. Well Gloats, the big no-brainer decision that simplify our problem should be made first are as follows. First, we are never going to create something worth 2 trillion by selling some generic beverage. Therefore, we must make your name Coca-Cola into a strong legally protected trademark. Second, we can get to two trillion only by starting in Atlanta, then succeeding in the rest of the United States, then succeeding with our new beverage all over the world. This will require developing a product having universal appeal because it harnesses powerful elemental forces. And the right place to find such powerful elemental forces is in subject matter of elementary academic courses. We will next use numer numerical fluency to ascertain that our target implies. What our target implies? We can guess reasonably that by 2034 there will be about 8 billion beverage consumers in the world. Our average, each of these on average, each of, each of these consumers will be much more prosperous in real terms than the average consumer of 1884. If our new beverage and other imitative beverages in our new market can flavor and otherwise improve only 25% of ingested water worldwide, and we can occupy half of the new world market, we can sell 3 trillion servings in 2034. And if we can then net 4 cents per serving, we will earn $117 billion. That this will be enough in our business if our business is still growing at a good rate to make it easily worth $2 trillion. A big question, of course, is whether 4 cents per serving is reasonable. And the answer is yes, if we can create a beverage with strong universal appeal. 150 years is a long time, so the law like the Roman drachma was almost surely suffer monetary depreciation. Concurrently, Real purchasing power of the average beverage consumer in the world will go way up. His productivity to inexpensively improve his experience will, while ingesting water will go up considerably faster. Meanwhile, as technology improves, the cost of our simple products in unit of constant purchasing power will go down. All four factors will work together in favor of our 4 cents per serving profit target. Worldwide beverage purchasing power in dollars will probably multiply by a factor of at least 40 over 150 years, sinking in reverse. This makes our profit per serving target under 1884 conditions a mere one fortieth of four cents or one tenth of a cent per serving. This is an easier to exceed target as we start out if our new product has universal appeal. 
that decided we must next solve the problem of invention to create universal appeal. There are two intertwined challenges of large scale. First, over 150 years, we must cause a new beverage market to assimilate about one-fourth of the world's water ingestion. Second, we must so operate that half the new market is ours, while our competitors combined are left to share the remaining half. These results are Lola Palozza results. Accordingly, we must attack our problem by causing every favorable factor we can think of to work for us. Plainly, only a pow powerful combination of many factors is likely to cause the Lola Palozza consequences we desire. Fortunately, the solution to this intertwined problem turns out to be fairly easy if one has stayed awake in all the French wines courses. Let us start by exploring the consequences of, sim of simplifying no-brainer decisions that we must rely on a strong trademark. This conclusion automatically leads to an understanding of the essence of our business in proper elementary academic terms. We can see from the introductory course in psychology that, in essence, we are going into the business of creating and maintaining conditioning if reflexes. The Coca-Cola trade name and, and trade dress will act as a stimuli and the purchase and ingestions will be the desired responses. And how does one create and maintain conditional reflexes? Well, psychology gives two answers. One, by operant conditioning and two, by classical conditioning often called Pavlovian conditioning to honor the great Russian scientist. And since we want a Lola Palozza result, we must use both conditioning and technique. And all we can invent to enhance effects of for each technique. The operant conditioning part of our problem is easy to solve. We, we, we need only one, maximum re rewards of our beverage ingestion and two, Minimize possibilities that desired reflexes once created by us will be extinguished through operant conditioning by proprietors of competing products. For operant conditioning rewards, there are only a few categories we will find practical. One, food value in calories, and two, flavors, textures, and aroma acting as stimuli to consumption under normal pre programming of man through Darwinian natural selection. Three, stimulus by sugar or caffeine. 4. Cooling effect when man is too hot or warming effect when man is too hot. Wanting a Lola Palozza result, we will naturally include rewards in all the categories. To start out, it is easy to decide to design our beverage for consumption cold. There is much less opportunity without ingesting beverage to counteract excessive heat compared with excessive cold. Moreover, with excessive heat, much liquid must be consumed, and the reverse is not true. It is also easy to decide to include both sugar and caffeine. After all, tea coffee are already widely consumed. And it is also clear that we must be fanatic about determining through trial and error flavor and other characteristics that will maximize human pleasure while taking in the sugared water and caffeine we will provide. And to counteract possibilities that desired operant condition reflexes, once created, will be extinguished by operant conditioning employing competing products. There is also an obvious, an obvious answer. We will make it permanent obsession in our company that our beverage, as fast as practicable, will at all times be available everywhere throughout the world. After all, a competing product if it is never tried, can't act as a reward creating a conflicting habit. Every spouse knows that. We must next consider the Pavlovian conditioning we must also use. In Pavlovian conditioning, powerful effects come from mere association. The neural system of Pavlov's dog causes it to salivate at the bell it can't eat. And the brain of man yearns for the type of beverage held by the pretty woman he can't have. And so gloats. We must use every sort of decent, honor honorable Pavlovian conditioning we can think of. For as long as we are in business, our beverage and its promotion must be associated in consumer minds with all, all other things consumers like or admire. Such extensive Pavlovian conditioning will cost a lot of money, particularly for advertising. We will spend big money as far ahead as we can imagine, but the money will be effectively spent. As we are spending fast in our new beverage market, 
Our competitors will face gross disadvantages of scale in buying advertising to create the Pavlovian conditioning they need. And this outcome, along with other volume, creates powerful effects. Should help us gain and hold at least 50% of the new market everywhere. Indeed, provided buyers are scattered, our higher volumes will give us very extreme cost advantages in distribution. Moreover, Pavlovian effects from mere association will help, help choose the flavor, texture and color of our new beverage. Considering Pavlovian effects, we will have wisely chosen the exotic and expensive sounding name Coca-Cola instead of a pedestrian name like gross sugar caffeinated water. For similar reasons, it will be wise to have our beverage look pretty much like wine instead of sugared water. And so we will artificially color our beverage if it comes out clear and we will carbonate our water making our product seem like champagne or some other expensive beverage while also making its flavor better and imitation harder to arrange for competing products. And because we are going to attach so many expensive psychological effects to our flavor, that flavor should be different from any other standard flavor so that we can maximize difficulties for competitors and give no accidental same flavor benefits to any existing product. What else from the psychology textbook can help our new business? Well, there is that powerful monkey see monkey do aspect of human nature that psychologists often call social proof. Social proof, imitative consumption, triggered by mere sight of consumption, will not only help industrial of our beverage, it will also bolster perceived rewards from consumption. We will always take this powerful social proof factor into account as we design advertising and sales promotion and as we forego present profits to enhance present and future consumption. More than with most other products, increasing selling power will come from each increase in sale. We can see now Glot that by combining much one much Pavlovian conditioning, two powerful social proof effects, and three a wonderful tasting, energy giving, uh, stimulating, and desirability, cold beverage that causes much upper and conditioning, we are going to get sales that speed up for a long time by reason of the huge mixture of factors that we have chosen. Therefore, we are going to start something like an autocatalytic reaction in chemistry, precisely the sort of multi-factor triggered Lola Palooza effect we need. The logistic and the distribution strategy of our business will be simple. There are only two practical ways to sell our beverage. One, as syrup to fountains and restaurants. Two, as a complete carbonated water product in, con in containers. Wanting Lola Palooza results, we will naturally do it both ways. And wanting huge Pavlovian and social proof effects, we will always spend on advertising and sales promotion, per serving over 40% of the fountain prices for syrup needed to make the serving. 40% of the price in advertising. A few syrup making plants can serve the world. However, to avoid needless shipping of mere space and water, we will need many bottling plants scattered over the world. We will maximize profits if, like early General Electric with light bulbs, we always set the first sale price, either one for fountain syrup and two for any container of our complete product. The best way to arrange this desirable profit maximizing control is to make any independent bottler we need a subcontractor, not a vendor of syrup and certainly not a vendor of syrup under perpetual franchise specifying a syrup price frozen forever at its starting level. Being unable to get a patent or corporate of our super important flavor, we will work obsessively to keep our formula secret. We will make a big hoopla over our secrecy, which will enhance Pavlovian effects, but eventually food chemical engineering will advance so that our flavor can be copied with near exactitude. But by that time, we will be so far ahead with such strong trademarks and complete always available worldwide distribution that good flavor copying won't bar us from our objective. Moreover, the advances in food chemistry that help competitors will almost surely be accompanied by technological advances that will help us, including refrigeration, better transportation, and for dieters, ability to insert a sugar test without inserting sugar calories. Also, there will be related beverage opportunities we will seize. 
This brings us to a final reality check for, of our business plan. We will once more think in reverse like Jacoby. What must be we avoid because we don't want it? Four answers seem clear. First, we must avoid the protective and clawing stop consumption effects of aftertaste that are standard part of physiology, developed through Darwinian evolution to enhance the replication of man's genes by forcing a general helpful moderation on the gene carrier. To serve our ends on hot days, a consumer must be able to drink container after container of our product with almost no impediment from aftertaste. We will find a wonderful no aftertaste flavor by trial and error and will thereby solve this problem. Second, we must avoid ever losing even half of our powerful trademark name. It will cost us mightily, for instance, if our sloppiness should ever also allow sales of any other kind of cola, for instance a Pepe Cola. If there is ever a Pepe Cola, we will be the proprietor of the brand. Third, with so much success coming, we must avoid bad effects from envy, which is given a prominent place in the Ten Commandments because envy is so much a part of human nature. The best way to avoid envy, recognized by Aristotle, is to plainly deserve the success we get. We will be fanatic about product quality, quality of product presentation, and reasonableness of prices, considering the harmless pleasure we will provide. Fourth, after our trademark flavor dominates our new market, we must avoid making any huge and sudden changes in our flavor. Even if a new flavor performs better to blind in blind test, tests, changing to that new flavor would be a foolish thing to do. This follows because under such conditions, our old flavor will be so entrenched in consumer preference by psychological effects that a big flavor change would do us little good and it would do immense harm by triggering in consumers the standard deprival super reaction syndrome that makes takeaway so hard to get in any type of negotiation and helps make most gamblers so irrational. Moreover, such a large fla flavor change would allow a competitor by copying our old flavor to take advantage of both. The hostile consumer super reaction is too, too deprival and too the huge love of our original flavor created by our previous work. Well, that is my solution to my own problem of turning 2 million into 2 trillion after paying out billions of dollars in dividends. I think it would have won with gloats in 1884 and should convince you more than you expected at the outset. After all, the correct strategies are clear after being related to elementary academic ideas brought into play by the helpful notion. How consistent is my solution with the history of the real Coca-Cola company? Well, as late as 1896, 12 years after the fictional gloss was to start vigorously with, with $2 million dollars, the real Coca-Cola company had a net worth under $150,000 and earnings of about zero. And thereafter, the real Coca-Cola did lose half its trademark and did grant perpetual bottling franchises at fixed zero prices and some of the bottlers were not very effective and couldn't easily be changed. And the real Coca-Cola company, with this system, did lose much pricing control that would have improved results, had it been retained. Yet even so, the real Coca-Cola company followed so much of the plan given to Gloss that it is now worth about $125 billion and will have to increase its value at only 8% per year until 2034 to reach a value of $2 trillion and it can hit an annual physical volume target of 3 trillion serving is serving grow until 2034 at 6%. Result consist consistent which with much past experience and leaving plenty of plain water ingestion for Coca-Cola to replace after 2034. So I would guess that the fictional gloss starting earlier and stronger and avoiding the worst errors would have easily hit the 2 trillion target and it would have done it well before 2034.